Good morning, everybody, and thank you for attending um, the second uh, 2021 RFP 2022 Housing Tax Credit Round 1 Multifamily Scoring Training. This scoring uh, training will provide guidance for completing the self-scoring worksheet within the Scoring Wizard. Um, and this training is also being recorded so that folks can watch it again at a later date. Your line will be muted and you'll be in listen only mode. If you have a question, please type it into the questions box. We'll answer your question during the webinar. And at the end, uh, if we have time left over, we will pause. Uh, and answer questions to the larger group, as well as take additional questions um, as time permits. At Minnesota Housing, we believe in our mission, housing is the foundation for success. So we collaborate with individuals, communities, and partners to create, preserve, and finance housing that is affordable. We offer products that support the development and preservation of affordable rental housing through both financing and long-term asset management. We also offer products and services to help Minnesotans buy and fix up their homes and stabilize neighborhoods, communities, and families. Thank you for being part of our mission. And please bear with me this morning as uh, I may have some delays in technology as we're all um, working in this um, remote world these days. So please bear with me if there are some delays. Uh, this tutorial will cover minimum thresholds, Minnesota housing strategic priorities, and selection categories and criteria. Please note that technical assistance provided by Minnesota housing staff is only advisory and does not guarantee that a development will receive points under a particular category or be selected for funding. While every effort is made to ensure the accuracy of the technical assistance provided, such assistance is subject to and does not modify or override the requirements of Minnesota housing's qualified allocation plan the self-scoring worksheets, the multifamily application instructions, multifamily underwriting standards, or other documents related to applications for funding. Applicants are encouraged to review the materials available on Minnesota Housing's website and consult with legal counsel and, if applicable, a knowledgeable tax professional to ensure compliance with all applicable application, submission, and project requirements. Here is our agenda for today. We'll cover what some of you um, need to know for the self-scoring worksheets. Uh, this document will be your companion document during this training. We advise you to either print out and have it next to you or have it available on a separate monitor while you're watching this training. Um, it is available in the attachments and handouts section of GoToWebinar, so you can pull it up now. It will be helpful to highlight parts of this worksheet that we emphasize for the training. Um, we will also share updates to this year's QAP and self-scoring worksheet. This training is meant to be a high-level overview. Um, we'll cover some details, but all of the details are found in the self-scoring worksheet. For more information, we'll show you where to go, um, which will be technical assistance and our website. So there are two key documents that you will need on the website. Uh, they are called the revised 2022-2023 self-scoring worksheet. This is the source of truth, and this worksheet will be your main reference tool for understanding the points you claim. The second, the second document is the scoring guide, 2021 Consolidated RFP 2022 HTC rounds one and two. This guide is the companion document and reference to the self-scoring worksheet. Much of the supporting documentation is listed in the self-scoring worksheet, 
but the scoring guide contains more detail and clarifications as needed. In some instances, helpful tools and templates are also linked in the scoring guide. This training will review these helpful tools and templates. I'll refer to these documents throughout the training as the self-scoring worksheet or the SSW and the scoring guide respectively. You will enter your scores into the scoring wizard in the multifamily portal. Once you enter your scores, you upload your documents into portal. Make sure that your documentation matches what you entered into the scoring wizard. Review both documents to make sure applications are competitive and are eligible to receive the points being claimed. And just a reminder, and we'll say this um, multiple times today, we encourage you to get technical assistance um, early on in the process so that you under, understand the scoring materials and that your application be, can be comp as competitive as possible. And the documents are uh, linked on this slide, but you can also find them here on Minnesota Housing's website, www.mnhousing.gov. Uh, you can click Apply for Funding under the Multifamily Rental Partners, found on the right side of the page. On the Apply for Funding tab, click Application Resources, and just scroll down to the applicable documents. So getting started into um, the meat of the training, all projects must meet at least one of the agency strategic objectives in our strategic plan or the strategic priority outlined in Minnesota Housing Statute for the Housing Tax Credit Program. The strategic priorities um, are no longer captured in the self-scoring worksheet directly. There is a question in the rental housing narrative where you will select one or more items and then provide a narrative summary on how you meet the objectives. So this year we have two preferences. The first is for eventual tenant ownership. This is now a preference and it will be used as one of the tiebreakers for tax credit applications. The second preference is innovative construction methods. Uh, and this was added as a, with a goal to reduce total construction costs. And there was a pre-application um, that was required for innovative construction techniques and this has passed. So this is no longer um available for applicants if you didn't submit the pre-application but this is um a powerpoint that we used earlier in the year <coughs> when this deadline was still uh, or when this option was still available so that's why it's still here but the innovative construction techniques is no longer available that pre-application deadline has passed but that is the second preference that we added this year Scoring is an integral part to the RFP application process, and it's one of several ways that Minnesota Housing selects projects for funding. Tax credit projects must meet a minimum point requirement to move forward in the RFP process. For 9% tax credit projects, the minimum point requirement is 80. Uh, this is a change from last year, so for 9% housing tax credit applications, minimum points are 80 this year. For 4% tax credit projects, the minimum point requirement is 40, 40, 40 points. It's important for applicants to know that these point thresholds represent the minimum points needed. In reality, um, competitive projects score much higher. So as an example, last year, minimum points were 70 and um, projects that were selected for funding were in the 120 range. Um, so for documentation of points, Minnesota Housing will only award points if they were claimed by applicants and if they meet the supporting documentation requirements outlined in the self-scoring worksheet and the scoring guide. Minnesota Housing will reduce points if the documentation does not meet the requirements. 
So think of it like you need to state your case and provide evidence for why you should receive those points. Um, so the take home message that you wanna remember um, today and throughout the application process is to make sure you claim your points and provide the documents to support those points. You will be prompted in the scoring wizard to document your units for each selection criteria. You'll be asked to enter either the total number of units or the number of restricted or assisted units for each selection criteria. Restricted and assisted mean the same thing for scoring purposes. Note, there are certain minimum unit requirements, rent restrictions, and income restrictions. Refer to the self-scoring worksheet and scoring guide as you claim your points. Minnesota Housing will validate the number of units with the multifamily workbook and will re reduce points if the documentation does not meet requirements. See the instruction section of the scoring guide for more information. We have a lot of good information in the instruction section of the scoring guide about documenting number of units, rent restrictions, income restrictions, et cetera. Um, so new this year, we have points a bit available for people with disabilities units that are eligible for Section 811 project-based rental assistance. Um, please note that you must complete the pre-app to be eligible for the Section 811 points as well as meet the PWD requirements in the self scoring worksheet. Also new is the extended duration, which is a tax credit requirement. This language is found on page five of the self scoring worksheet. This is a change from previous years where owners applying for funds agree to waive the qualified contract and rental and occupancy restrictions apply for the term of the LURA. Also on page five, we address deeper rent targeting. All projects must set aside a minimum of 2% of units at the 30% MTSP rent levels and must set aside a minimum of 3% of unit rent at or below the housing assistance payment standard, also known as the HAP standard. All 9% applicants in round one must meet a minimum threshold. There are five threshold categories available to applicants. Projects in the metropolitan area, projects outside of the metropolitan area, projects not restricted to persons of a particular age group, uh, of which a percentage of the units are set aside and rented to persons with a disability, preserving existing uh, subsidized housing and rural development. Projects can meet more than one threshold. For example, a preservation project might also meet the metropolitan area threshold. For the sake of time, we're keeping these thresholds very high level um, since there were no changes from last year. Um, please look at the self-scoring worksheet and scoring guide for more details. Um, so now uh, we will run through the selection criteria, which starts on page eight of the uh, self-scoring worksheet. And this is gonna be um, the bulk of the information that you guys are going to want to know. <coughs> Excuse me. There are seven selection categories that establish the scoring framework. Uh, these categories are greatest need tenant targeting, serves lowest income for long duration, which includes preservation, increasing geographic choice, supporting community and economic development, efficient use of scarce resources, building characteristics, and for 9% um, tax credit applications, unacceptable practices. Each category is broken down into various selection criteria that equate to points. The first selection category is greatest need tenant targeting. The scoring criteria in this category are large family housing, 
senior housing, permanent supportive housing for high priority homeless, also known as HPH. Um, and then a subcategory of HPH is continuum of care. And then people with disabilities, also known as PWD. Um, and this includes two tiers, including that section 811 um, tier that we talked about earlier. So the first scoring criterion under greatest need tenant targeting and selection category is large family housing. Large family housing is for, pro is for proposals for projects that provide family housing that is not restricted to persons 55 years or older. Uh, if selecting this criterion, applicants agree to market to families with minor children. At least 75% of the total assisted units need to contain two or more bedrooms, and then applicants can claim additional points if at least one-third um, of the three-plus bedrooms contain four or more bedrooms. The unit calculation is based on calculations using the number of assisted units. An assisted unit is defined as a tax credit unit for tax credit applications and affordable units for deferred funding. Minnesota Housing will validate the number of units entered in the self-scoring worksheet with the number of units indicated on the unit rent grid in the, on the housing income tab of the project's workbook. The second Scoring criterion in the greatest need tenant targeting selection category is senior housing. And this is a new scoring category this year. 100% of the assisted units must be restricted and marketed to seniors aged 55 plus. Um, but note that only one member of the household needs to meet that age threshold. Applicants can take additional points for further restricting a percentage of the units to the 30% income levels consistent with the Housing Infrastructure Bond or HIB statute. A project can either be senior housing or large family housing, but it cannot be both. Additionally, senior housing units that are further restricted cannot overlap with rental assistance units that are further restricted. The third scoring criterion in the greatest need tenant targeting and selection category is permanent supportive housing for high priority homeless or HPH. To be eligible for HPH points, the project must meet the HPH threshold requirements and have a minimum of 5% of the total units, but no fewer than four units, um, set aside and rented to households prioritized for permanent supportive housing by the coordinated entry system. Applicants can receive additional continuum of care points if projects prioritize the local need identified by the local continuum of care. Note that applicants can see um, the COC priorities listed for a project's county by reviewing the continuum of care or COC priorities methodology. And this is linked in the scoring guide. And bear with me for a second. My computer is a little slow. All right, here we go. Um, so a reminder, HPH and PWD points cannot be claimed on the same units. And we'll talk about PWD in a minute here. Um, you can have both units in your project, but you cannot claim points for the same unit. So PWD and HPH need to be separate units. The HPH calculation is based on the number of total units. Make sure the scoring wizard and multifamily workbook numbers match. The HPH units must be marked as HPH units on the rent and income grid in the workbook, 
and the type of rental subsidy must be indicated. If no subsidy is available, rent levels must be underwritten to the supportive, ho supportive housing unit's underwriting standards outlined in the multifamily underwriting standards, and they must be financially feasible. And then again, just a reminder, HPH units cannot overlap with the PWD units that we'll be talking about next. Um, and another reminder that rural development or RD projects may be prohibited from selecting particular rent and income restrictions and or tenant household types. Um, consult with RD and Minnesota housing staff with questions related to this. Uh, and also note that the South Scoring Worksheet outlines several threshold requirements that must be met in order to receive uh, the HPH point. The fourth scoring criterion in the greatest need tenant targeting category is people with disabilities or PWD. To be eligible for this category, projects must meet the PWD threshold requirements and have a minimum of four units. The proposal must not have age restrictions on any of the units to be eligible for PWD points. So I'm just gonna restate that again. The proposal must not have any age restrictions on any of the units to be eligible for PWD points. A percentage of the units are set aside and rented to people with disabilities as outlined on page 11 and 12 of the self-scoring worksheet. Minnesota Housing will validate the number of PWD units and all other information with the submitted multifamily workbook. The units must be marked as PWD on the rent and income grid of the workbook, and the income limit should be restricted to 30% MTSP, and the type of rental subsidy must be indicated. If no subsidy is available, rent levels must be underwritten to the supportive housing unit's underwriting standards outlined in the multifamily underwriting standards, and they must be financially feasible. Rural development or RD projects may be prohibited from selecting particular rent and income restrictions and or tenant household types. Consult with RD and Minnesota housing staff with questions related to this. Uh, and again, just keep in mind that this category does not permit age restrictions. So senior projects are ineligible for PWD points and projects with any age restrictions on even a portion of the unit are ineligible for PWD points. Also note that the self-scoring worksheet outlines several threshold requirements that must be met uh, in order to be eligible for PWD points. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so our Reminder here again, HPH and PWD points cannot be claimed on the same unit. You can have both in a project, but those units cannot overlap. The second selection category is serves lowest income for long duration. The scoring criteria in this category are preservation, rental assistance, serves lowest income tenants slash rent reduction and long-term affordability. The first scoring criterion under serves lowest income for long durations is preservation. Projects must meet one of three risk of loss thresholds. Additionally, projects must meet one of three scoring criteria. The most notable item to keep in mind for preservation is that preservation projects cannot claim rental assistance and in certain cases cannot claim serves lowest income points. The dependencies between uh, the three can be tricky. Uh, we have provided further clarification in the scoring guide on these dependencies. Applicants are strongly encouraged to get technical assistance for preservation projects. The second scoring criterion in the serves lowest income for long duration selection category is rental assistance. 
The distinction between preservation and rental assistance projects is based upon the rental assistance contract, and it is defined in the self scoring worksheet. Applicants will receive priority if a fully executed binding commitment for project-based rental assistance is submitted with the application. A binding commitment could include a binding resolution or a binding letter of approval from a governing body. Units with rental assistance must be counted in this category. The unit cannot be counted towards the served lowest income category. So for example, a 40 unit project with 40 rental assistance vouchers cannot claim points in the served lowest income category. Commitment documentation for rental assistance must be fully executed, state the project name, and include the number of units. Commitment documentation for further restricting incomes no longer needs to state the approval of the governing body. Commitment documentation contingent on a Minnesota housing award is acceptable. For private rental assistance, in addition to these items above, the commitment documentation must be for at least four years. Minnesota Housing will validate the number of rental assistance units with the workbook. The units must be marked as rental assistance on the rent and income grid in the workbook, and the type of rental subsidy must be indicated. Provide a fully executed binding commitment as supporting documentation. Again, commitments must be fully binding. A commitment can be contingent on receiving an award from Minnesota Housing but a commitment cannot be subject to a third party RFP to award vouchers at a later date. I wanna reiterate that preservation projects cannot claim rental assistance. Um, we have provided further clarification in the scoring guide on all unit dependencies, including preservation and rental assistance. And again, applicants are strongly encouraged to get technical assistance for preservation projects. The third criterion in this category is serves lowest income tenant slash rent reduction. Um, just like last year, applicants can claim points for a percentage of units with rent that are at or below the 50% MTSP limit. New this year, applicants can receive additional points for further restricting units to the 30% MTSP rent limit. Minnesota Housing will validate the units with the multifamily workbook. Serves lowest income selection criterion cannot be claimed for units that qualify um, as units that have new or existing rental assistance. This would include people with disabilities or PWD tier two select, uh, section 811 um, project-based rental assistance. Preservation tier one existing federal assistance and rental assistance. So again, all of this is um, further clarified in detail in the scoring guide, um, this and all other unit dependencies. Uh, so here are the rental, uh, the rent and income limits on our website found under Quick Links. And uh, most of these are available um, for this year on our website at the date of this presentation. The fourth and final criterion in the serves lowest income for long durations category is long-term affordabil affordability. Deferred projects are now eligible, um, and we also added additional points for 50-year terms. The next category is increasing geographic choice. 
and it includes three criteria. The need for more affordable housing options is a new criterion. Uh, workforce housing is the same and access to transit was renamed to transit and walkability. Um, there are a few changes to that that uh, we'll discuss later. Um, and then we also eliminated economic integration and high performing schools. To help you score, use the community profiles tool located on our website. Um, you can see if you go over um, to policy and research and then community profiles, you will find the links to the community profiles tool. Communities with a need for more affordable housing options can now receive points. Applicants can use the community profiles tool to see if their project is eligible based on its location. No supporting documentation is required for this criterion. Um, transit and walkability, this category has two key components access to fixed transit, and then walkability. Applicants claim eligibility based on how projects fit into three geographic categories. Uh, metropolitan areas, greater Minnesota urbanized areas, and greater Minnesota rural and small urban areas. Scattered site projects should use a weighted average for eligibility based upon the total number of units that meet each category. Applicants do not need to submit documentation unless they are claiming points for demand response or dial a ride. See the scoring guide for more information. The fourth selection category is supporting community and economic development. There are six criteria in this category. Community development initiatives, equitable development, which is new this year, rural and tribal, QCT, community revitalization, tribal equivalent areas, and now opportunity zones, multifamily award history, which is also new this year, and black, indigenous, and people of color owned slash women owned business enterprise. The first scoring criterion under the Supporting Community and Economic Development Initiative um, is the Community Development Initiative. To be eligible for this criterion, projects must be targeted, must, uh, projects must be a targeted geographic area, and applicants must submit a map of the area. Applicants need to submit a copy of the initiative or plan, Note that affordable housing needs to be listed as a key strategy of the plan. Applicants also need to submit a stakeholder list that identifies the roles of stakeholders. Uh, and additionally, applicants must submit the community development initiative narrative and outline the current implementation plan and identify completed, underway, or planned milestones. Note applicants in a qualified census tract or QCT must provide additional documentation demonstrating commitment of public or private investment in non-housing infrastructure, amenities, or services. Eligible initiatives or plans could include neighborhood plans, county plans, or comprehensive plans. Comprehensive plans will not count on their own, however. Um, you must submit an acceptable community development initiative narrative as a supplement, um, including all updates and supporting documentation described on the previous slides. Housing and market studies are not eligible for these points. The second criterion in this category is equitable development. Uh, it is new this year and it is designed to amplify the voices, input, and needs of communities most impacted or CMIs 
in the development process. To be eligible for equitable development, submit documentation that meets all four of the following uh, threshold criteria at the time of application. We'll go through each threshold in more detail, but here is a list of the threshold um, criteria just for reference here. So all four need to be met, um, and they include significant involvement of a qualified stakeholder group, housing disparity addressed by the development, significant involvement of the qualified um, stakeholder group, and provide a signed letter um, from the qualified stakeholder group. Applicants must complete the equitable development narrative and submit documentation demonstrating how the initiative meets the requirements. Any documentation, plan, or data referenced in the narrative must be provided to demonstrate the project meets this criteria. Um, so the first threshold, um, a qualifying stakeholder group must have meaningful representation of communities most impacted who have an active and participatory role in shaping and carrying out the priorities and goals of the stakeholder group. Its mission and purpose must have some connection to uplifting and supporting communities most impacted in its work. Multiple, stake, uh, multiple qualified stakeholder groups are acceptable but each uh, must on their own meet the threshold criteria. Refer to the self-scoring worksheet um, for more details um, and a full list of what is needed in the narrative. Um, and just to, the, the communities most impacted are listed on the slide here. Those include um, the lowest income, uh, people of color, indigenous people, LGBTQ people, people experiencing homelessness, people with disabilities, immigrants, large families, seniors, or families with children. Uh, for the second threshold, housing disparity addressed by development, uh, applicants must provide data for at least one community's most impacted represented in the qualified stakeholder group demonstrating housing disparity and identify how the project will address that disparity. Um, data should apply to people living in Minnesota. And so examples of data could include the Wilder Foundation's Community Compass, published research or evaluation reports, um, or federal, state, or local government da data, again, um, specific to Minnesota or communities in Minnesota. The third threshold that must be met um, is significant involvement of the qualified stakeholder group um, in development. So um, applicants must explain how the qualified stakeholder group was involved in the development, the specific input they provided, and how the project responds to that input. Um, it must be in addition to minimum QAP requirements and points taken in other selection criteria. So for example, serve lowest income tenants or high priority homeless. Um, so, and the fourth threshold that must be met um, is a signed letter from the qualified stakeholder group. Um, and make sure that you're referring to the self-scoring worksheet for more information. So as another example for design, a qualified stakeholder group representing an immigrant CMI meaningfully involved in the um, architectural design of intergenerational housing, which directly responds to the input provided by the stakeholder group would be something that would account for this category. And again, this is new, um, so if you have questions, please reach out for technical assistance. Um, moving on to the other categories under um, supporting community and economic development, um, rural tribal. This did not have any changes. 
no supporting documentation is required for this criterion. Applicants can use the community profiles tool to see if their project is eligible for points. The next item is Q QCT, community revitalization, tribal equivalent area, and the new this year opportunity zones. Um, this year, applicants can receive points if the project is located in, in an opportunity zone. No supporting documentation is required for this criterion. Um, again, this is mapped in community profiles. And please note that to be eligible for QCT points, applicants um, must submit a plan that meets the requirements for community development initiatives. So essentially, um, in order to receive QCT points, community development initiative points um, must be um, awarded as well. Uh, and the last category, which again is new this year, is the multifamily award history. Um, so applicants can receive points if the project is located in a community that hasn't received a multifamily Minnesota housing award in the past five years. Um, you can review the multifamily award history methodology to see if your project is eligible. Uh, no supporting documentation is required. And again, all methodologies are um, on our website and then they are also linked in the scoring guide um, so that you can find and access them easily. Uh, in the last category under supporting community and economic development, development um, is what was previously known as Maybe Weeby. Um, this has been changed to Black, Indigenous, and people of color owned slash women owned business enterprise, um, also BIPOC BB for short. Um, no changes were made to the ownership portion of this criterion. So it's the same as um, what you are used to. All information um, is listed in the scoring guide. Um, it needs to be 51% owned by one or more BIPOC or women. Um, and that is all listed in the self-scoring worksheet and scoring guide. New this year, um, applicants are now eligible for additional points for partnerships with BIPOC VB entities. Um, so to be eligible, applicants must provide an agreement executed between the partnering entity or entities that defines specific duties and roles and explicitly states the goal of building the BIPOC Weebies capacity to develop, manage, construct, design, or own affordable housing in the future. The fifth selection category is efficient use of scarce resources and leverage. So there are three scoring criteria um, in this category financial readiness to proceed slash leveraged funds, other contributions, and intermediary costs. Um, cost containment was eliminated this year. The first scoring criterion under um, the efficient use of scarce resources and leverage selection category is financial readiness to proceed slash leveraged funds. The intent of this criterion is to give applicants credit for secured funding commitments for permanent capital funding sources. The key change this year is that the denominator no longer has any exclusions. The numerator excludes the first mortgage uh, and estimated tax credit proceeds. The calculation now shows the total sources committed in comparison to the total development cost. All secured funding commitments for capital funding must be counted under this selection, under this criterion. <laughs> they cannot be counted under other contributions that we'll describe later. Um, so let me just restate that. Um, all secured funding commitments for capital funding must be counted under this criterion. They cannot be counted under other contributions. Um, this can be calculated by dividing total secured funding by the total development cost. Uh, the self-scoring worksheet and scoring guide contain detailed information and examples of acceptable documentation um, and source examples.
The second scoring criterion under the efficient use of scarce resources and leverage selection category is other contributions. The intent of this criterion is to give applicants credit for non-capital sources that reduce development costs and are not reflected on the sources or uses tabs in the workbook. Examples um, could include waivers of fees, land donations, or any other contributions that reduce the overall cost of the project. All non-capital sources must be counted in this calculation, um, and applicants cannot count them in the financial readiness to proceed slash leverage funds calculation described earlier. The self-scoring worksheets and scoring guide contain, de contain detailed information and examples of acceptable documentation um, and sources examples. Please pay, pay close attention to these documents when obtaining commitments. The third scoring criterion under the efficient use of scarce resources and leverage selection category is intermediary costs. Generally, intermediary costs are soft costs associated with third party services related to project development. For example, architect fees, engineering fees, appraisal fees, fees for historic consultants, et cetera. Projects receive more points for negotiating lower costs. The self-scoring worksheet contains the only exclusions that will be allowed for this category. And keep in mind that large amounts of exclusions should be backed up by supporting documentation submitted with the application. The sixth selection category is building characteristics and there are three scoring criterion in this category, universal design, smoke-free buildings, and enhanced sustainability. The first selection criterion under building characteristics um, is universal design. So new for this year, applicants must submit the universal design worksheets um, the universal design worksheet and architectural and construction application items will be reviewed to uh, determine eligibility for this criteria. The determination to award points will be made at the sole discretion of Minnesota Housing. And for elevator buildings, 100% of the assisted units must meet the definition. And for non-elevator buildings, at least 10% of the assisted units must meet the definition of universal design. The second selection criterion under the building characteristics selection category is smoke-free buildings. Applicants are certifying at the time of application that a lease addendum and written smoke-free policies will be provided during the due diligence process if selected. So no um, supporting documentation is required at the time of application for smoke-free buildings. The third and last selection criterion under the building characteristics selection category is enhanced sustainability. Applicants have three tier options including two or three times the minimum number of optional criteria or conforming to one of three alternative performance pathways. Applicants are encouraged to get technical assistance for enhanced sustainability requirements. <coughs> Excuse me. The final selection category is unacceptable practices. This category only applies to tax credit projects, and it may only apply to specific tax credit types. So for example, 9% projects um, and 4% projects. Minnesota Housing will impose the penalty points on projects where warranted. Um, and just uh, another reminder, the self-scoring worksheet is your source of truth. So make sure you are paying attention to all of the information in that self-scoring worksheet. 
uh, you will enter your scores into the scoring wizard and you are going to want to make sure that your documentation matches what you entered in the scoring wizard um, and also um, meets all of those requirements outlined in that self-scoring worksheet. The scoring guide is your reference tool for the self-scoring worksheet. So we have included um, important clarifications as well as links to things like the methodologies, um, in some instances templates, um, and other things that will make it easier for you um, to navigate and um, make sure your supporting documentation is eligible. Um, and we also encourage everybody to get technical assistance. All right, um, so thank you for watching this training. Um, I will, um, in a minute here, move over to see if we had any questions come in. Um, but I just wanna um, remind folks, if you have questions as you're completing your application, please contact your assigned underwriter. Um, if you do not have an assigned underwriter, please um, complete the technical assistance request form that is shown, uh, the link is shown on this slide here, um, and you will be assigned an underwriter who will help you throughout the application process. Um, so now I'm just gonna see if we received any questions. And let's see. Have to expand this box here. It looks like we have a couple here. Okay, um, so questions that came in throughout the um, training that I'll just read out loud to folks because everybody can always benefit from the answers. So first question, are you eligible for the full points um, if your proposal has more than 25% PWD units? Um, so let me kind of rephrase that question. So um, if a project has more than 25% of the overall project units, that will be PWD. Are you eligible for the full points? Um, and so that's kind of a uh, a tricky. Uh, let me let me think through. Okay, so if, if for PWD tier one, you do not need to limit the number of um, PWD units to 25% of the overall project units. Um, you can have more than 25% of the overall pro um, project units as PWD units, but you will only be awarded up to 25% of those units. Um, for PWD Tier 2, um, these units, these Section, 8, uh, Section 811 units, cannot exceed 25% of the units and cannot exceed 11 units total. Um, so let me just kind of restate that um, question and answer again. So um, for PWD Tier One, can you have more than the 25? Can you have more than 25% of your overall project units as PWD? The answer is yes, but you will only receive um, points for up to 25% of those. And um, for PWD Tier Two. Um, these number of units cannot exceed 25% of units in the project, and then they cannot exceed 11 units total. Um, another question, could a qualified stakeholder group be a service provider? Um, the service provider of record cannot on its own qualify as a stakeholder group. A committee, consortium, or advisory group that has representation by a community's most impacted or CMI could qualify as um, a qualified stakeholder group. The service provider could be a member of that group. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Again, if you have any questions on um, um, this category as you're filling out your application, please reach out for technical assistance. This is new uh, this year, and we are more than happy um, to work with folks um, to see what would be eligible to this category. Um, so that is that's all the questions that we received. Um, if you have any last minute questions, please type them into the question box now. Otherwise, um, we wrapped up about five minutes early, which is great. 
um, that'll give you everybody time to transition to um, their next meetings if they have any. Um, again, want to thank everybody for watching this training. This was recorded. It will be posted on our website. Um, we will send out an e-news once it is available. This is the second training that we offered. So the first one was also recorded. Um, both will be available on the website for future reference. We have also provided two trainings, um, demoing the scoring wizard. Um, if you weren't able to attend those, those were recorded and posted on our website as well. So we'll send out another e-news with reminders about that. Um, we have the self-scoring worksheet and the scoring guide on our website. These PowerPoints, um, the slides are available on our website. And then, of course, as always, technical assistance is always an option. Um, we strongly encourage it. Um, and if you have not yet been assigned an underwriter, we encourage you to go to this technical assistance request form and get someone assigned to you um, so that your application be, can be as competitive as possible. Uh, and it looks like we didn't have any more um, questions come in, so we are gonna sign off. Thank you everybody um, and enjoy the rest of your day.